really happened to me. And when I was a little girl, I had a best friend, and he was a little boy who lived down the street from me. And I lived in a neighborhood that was built on an old apricot orchard, and so we had these huge apricot trees. And this little boy and I, we would spend all of our time up in these trees, and basically lived up there. And um, he was kind of a mischievous kid. He was always trying to get me in trouble. Like, he'd tickle me during the Pledge of Allegiance, so my teacher would yell at me for laughing while we were saying the pledge. Or, and um, his other favorite thing to do was to try to trick me into kissing him. <laughs> so he'd come up with these games, and like, for some reason, I would have to kiss him as part of the game, like, whatever. And, um, but when we were in the second grade, his dad got a new job, and they moved across, across the country. They moved to Tennessee. And I pretty much accepted that I was never going to see him again, so we kind of parted ways. And really, after about a year or two, um, you know, I made new friends, that type of thing, and those little kid memories kind of fade away, and I, I forgot all about him. And um, then in the ninth grade, I one day, you know, I, I I'm from Salt Lake City. I mean, I live in the live in this really quiet suburban town. Nothing very interesting interesting happened very often. But um, one day, I walked into my history class. And normally the desk behind mine was always empty. But this day, there was a guy sitting there. And I couldn't see his face, but I could, I could just tell, like from seeing just the back of him, that this guy was trouble, like trouble with a capital T. <laughs> and you know, he had kind of this long hair, and he was, he was thin, and he had these ripped up clothes. And I could tell, even just by looking at him, he kind of had that look that um, he was most likely a drug addict. And so I just walk in, I'm like, oh, why me? Why does he have to be sitting in the chair behind mine? This is, oh. And I was just going, how am I, how am I gonna come sit by this, this person? And so finally I was like, okay, if I don't bother him, he won't bother me. So I go and I sit down in the chair and about 2.5 seconds later, he starts bothering me. And he starts asking me all these questions and he's kind of goading me kind of trying to get me upset, and it worked. And after about a minute, I finally just turned around and I said, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> and then he looked up at me and said, so you don't recognize me then? And I realized the only thing I recognized were his eyes. Everything else was so different. And I realized in that moment, this was my old best friend. And I was so, shocked that all I could say was his name. So I said his name and then the teacher walked in and she started class. Well, I spent the rest of class sitting there going, <laughs> what do I do? This is my old best friend. I think he's a drug addict. He looks really scary, but I can't ignore him. He's my old best friend, you know. And, and um, so I spent the whole class wondering, okay, what am I going to do about this? How is this going to affect my life? I can't, you know, what happened to him? Obviously something happened to him to make him this way. But I never got to find out what would happen because before class was over, he got kicked out by the teacher. And then, so the next day I went to school and I had all this trep trepidation. I'm gonna see him again. What are we gonna do? La la la, go to class. And he's not there. And I started asking around and I found out that not only was he kicked out of class that day, he was kicked out of the entire school on the first day. And not only that, but this was his last chance school. This was the, he'd been kicked out of every school in the area. This was the last school that was willing to give him a chance, and he blew it. He never saw him again. And I always, that kind of always haunted me, and I always kind of wondered, well, well, what happened to him to make him this way? What happened to him after that? And kind of always the idea of what would have happened to me, um, and you know, what would my family's reaction have been if he hadn't disappeared? I kind of always wondered that. Well, several years passed, lots of other things happened, babies, car accidents, crazy stuff, and I decided, but I was on this path that I was going to be an author. I was writing every day, and I um, was working on another book at, a, at the time, and um, I was, this was January 2005, and January in Salt Lake City is like the crappiest time to be anywhere. Normally love Utah, love Salt Lake City. I'm so glad to be here in January. Like, it's so cold, and they have this horrible inversion that sets in on the city, and everybody's just really depressed, and like, oh, you know, everybody wants to come to California. <laughs> but, <laughs> and one night, I was driving down the street and just feeling that weight, just that weight of January and the cold, and stopped at a stoplight.
light, and I looked up at a billboard. I cannot to this day tell you what the billboard said, but something in the billboard suddenly sparked that memory of this old friend, and I hadn't thought of him in probably 10 years. And suddenly that whole scene played out in my head of seeing him again and the you don't recognize me and all those worries and wonders and whatever happened to him. And suddenly after, you know, it was like this split second where that all flashed in my head, suddenly this conversation started. And it was a conversation between a brother and a sister. And the brother was warning his sister to stay away from an old friend who had disappeared and come back. And he was saying to her, you know, he's dangerous. He is not the person he used to be. You have to stay away from him. I could not shake this conversation. I had never felt something so strongly before. And I knew that the brother knew something. You know, what did he know? What did he know that the sister didn't? And why was he telling her to stay away from this friend? And I could tell that she didn't want to. And so I went home, and they wouldn't stop talking. And so I opened up a notebook. And I sat down and I started writing. And I first wrote out the scene of what happened with my old friend and then led into um, this conversation. Well, that is the first chapter of The Dark Divine. And I kept writing and I wrote pretty much the first three chapters with, within almost one sitting. And they're almost completely the same. They've had a few, you know, little revisions here and there, but they're almost totally the same. But for me, you know, writing The Dark Divine was kind of this magical experience where it was there. It was in my head, it was there, these characters were there, and they were talking to me, and they were not, they were not going to stop until I told their story. 